Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar from Internews' Earth Journalism Network. We're very pleased you can join us today for our panel on Living Between the Land and the Sea, a webinar for journalists on covering coastal resilience. Uh, we have an outstanding set of panelists uh, today. I'm going to introduce them to you quite, quite soon, brief. Um, but first, I thought I would take a few moments to introduce myself and the Earth Journalism Network. My name is James Fon. I'm the director of EJN. Uh, we are a project of internews uh, that carries out media development uh, activities around the world. Our mission is to improve the quantity and quality of environment and climate coverage. And we're also, I'm pleased to say, a global community of over 14,000 journalists from more than 180 countries, all dedicated to this mission. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we offer lots of opportunities for professional journalists. It is free to, for you to become a member. Um, we, at the moment, for instance, we have story grants available for any journalists interested in, in, in proposing stories about coastal resilience. You can check out that opportunity on our website at www.earthjournalism.com. Net, and I encourage you to, if you have any ideas for stories you'd like to do on coastal resilience, please do consider applying. The deadline is uh, February 17th, so just about a week away. So do get those applications in. Um, but on to our webinar. We're, we, this is the first of a series of webinars that we're going to be hosting for you over the coming two years, all looking at various aspects of coastal resilience, which as I'm sure you're aware is becoming an absolutely critical issue as climate change continues to affect billions of coastal residents around the world in, in many ways, often in ways we're not even aware of. Um, so today we're very pleased to be joined by a distinguished group of panelists. They include Moshimi Chaudhry, the Climate Resilience Research Associate at the World Resources Institute. Thank you, Moshimi, for joining us. We also have Stephanie Tai. Uh, I'm sorry, Stephanie Tai is the Climate Resilience Research Associate at the World Resources Institute. My, my apologies. Moshimi is the Community Resilience Program Director at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and we're, we're very grateful for both of you uh, today for joining us today. And finally, we have Jody Gupta, the director of the Third Pole and the manager of our India projects at the Earth Journalism Network. Uh, we're looking forward to a very lively discussion. Um, basically, the format for this will be each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, if you have questions, we certainly encourage questions from the audience. Uh, please put them in the Q&A feature. You'll see the button for that at the bottom of your screen. So don't put them in the chat. The chat is for other purposes. We, we encourage you to put questions in the Q&A feature. And after everyone has spoken, we'll turn to those questions and, and we'll, I expect we'll have a very lively discussion. So to kick things off, I'm gonna turn it over to Moshimi. Uh, again, she's from the Nature Conservancy and she is gonna be speaking on She's going to be giving us a broad overview of coastal resilience issues and uh, describing some of the nature-based solutions that are becoming available. Moshimi, you want to take things over? Yes, thank you so much, James, and good morning to everyone from Washington, D.C. I'm really glad to be on this panel and uh, share with you very briefly um, about the value of nature-based solutions. So give me one moment to share my screen. And here we are. So I'm going to be talking about um, the value of nature-based solutions and why they're specifically extremely useful to build climate resilience. So I'm going to start by just providing some basic facts. Many of you may know these facts um, about the needs for climate change adaptation and the impacts that climate change has had on people. Firstly, more than 11,000 disasters have occurred over the last 50 years, and they've all been attributed to weather 
climate and water related hazards. And this has led to 2 million deaths and $3.6 trillion in economic losses around the world. More than 600 million people, or roughly 10% of the world's population, live in coastal areas that are less than 10 meters above sea level. So very, very susceptible to sea level rise and other climate hazards, such as storms. And rising seas and greater storm surges could cost coastal, especially urban areas, more than a trillion dollars each year by 2050. So huge impacts of climate change on coastal areas and people living along the coast. So what can we do about this? This is where nature-based solutions comes in. I really like this graphic because it captures multiple nature-based solutions that can help us. And I will go dive into specifically what reefs can do for us and what mangroves can do for us specifically because they are huge ecosystems and um, we, can, we can get a lot of benefits by, by protecting them and managing them properly. So what this infographic tries to do is it captures how um, coral reefs, for instance, can reduce 95, 90, sorry, 97% of wave energy um, that act as storm barriers. And if you also have mangroves along the coast as well, that can help reduce 66% of wavelengths. These have huge economic impacts as well in terms of protecting people and land um, and the, the economic activity that goes along in the coast, coastal areas, for instance, fishing and tourism. So huge, huge benefits in terms of protecting coral reefs and mangroves. And some ecosystems like mangroves can also have mitigation benefits. So not just adaptation benefits that can help people um, cope with disasters, but also um, help reduce or, or help yes, help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So here on the bottom right, you'll see that um, marshes can um, not only help reduce um, shrimp and blue crab, but seagrass in near marshy areas can also um, you know, help reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well. So let me dive in a little bit more in terms of the value of reefs. In terms of increasing climate resilience, um, as I've mentioned, reefs can reduce wave energy by 97%. They protect more than 200 million people from storms around the world. And they also help to reduce livelihoods and improve livelihoods and food security. So for instance, coral reef fisheries around the world are worth $6.8 billion um, in terms of fish production. Fish accounts for about 17% of protein at the global level and exceeds 50% in many least developed countries. So again, protecting coral reefs not only helps us reduce impacts of climate change, but also helps protect food security. And approximately 50% of all international tourists travel to coastal areas. So again, offering huge economic benefits to people living along the coast. And finally, they offer valuable goods and services worth about $375 billion each year to communities around the world. So extremely significant, um, extremely valuable natural resources. Moving on to the value of mangroves, and here again, we'll see multiple benefits. So in terms of increasing climate resilience, as I've mentioned, it's estimated that just 100 meters of mangroves can reduce wave height by 66%. Mangroves keep pace with moderate sea level rise, increasing the resilience of coastlines. They also prevent more than $65 billion in property damages and reduce flood risks to some 15 million people every year around the world. And of course, they also help improve livelihoods and food security. So in many countries, over 80% of small scale fishers rely on mangroves, and there are over 4.1 million mangrove fishers globally. So again, huge benefits, multiple benefits. So I wanted to share with you just some, some highlights of what we're doing at the Nature Conservancy. Um, one, in, in one of the projects called the Nature Protects People Project, um, we are trying to uh, build awareness about the value of nature-based solutions such as mangroves and reef, reefs, but also multiple other ecosystems. So what we've done is produce this blue guide to coastal risk and resilience. Um, and I would highly recommend that you check out this platform, www.natureprotects.org, um, to download this guide. This guide has been primarily 
prepared for um, people in the disaster risk reduction world, um, people who work on climate change adaptation, um, to help them better understand um, what are the different um, values of nature-based solutions, what are the different conditions under which um, these ecosystems can reduce the impact of climate change, because um, there is no guarantee that these um, ecosystems will be uh, will be able to successfully benefit us in every single context. There are various conditions around which um, these, these ecosystems can help us. And of course, um, this, uh, this blue guide also helps look at um, issues around governance um, and, and how to actually plan and incorporate nature-based solutions into project planning. Um, we've been training the blue guide, training people to how to use the blue guide to coastal resilience. And we are also working with the Global Disaster Preparedness Center to um, develop an eco DRR app, um, which helps to mobilize community level action and specifically targeting small and medium scale enterprises to help them be better prepared for climate disasters and build better awareness about nature based solutions. We're also supporting governments in various countries to integrate nature-based solutions into their disaster risk reduction um, and climate policies. And we're building awareness about nature-based solutions among women's networks in particular, because as many of you know, women uh, play a significant role in terms of managing their natural resources, including reefs and mangroves. I wanted to take uh, just a minute to dive in a little bit deeper into um, one of our most interesting uh, projects. Um, and this is about ensuring coral reefs. Um, and this is a very innovative project. One of, I would say, I haven't heard of any other actually. Um, and so what we're doing at the Nature Conservancy is working with um, the, the Mexican government to uh, help, help create a um, insurance so that would protect reefs. So let's say a storm is coming in, especially in this particular Caribbean coastline, as you see in the maps here. Um, and if the, the storm reaches a certain uh, velocity and there, and which would create significant damages to coastal areas, um, there would be a payout uh, to communities or whoever is buying the insurance um, so that they can use that money to rebuild reefs um, so that they can offer their protective value again if another storm comes in. So we were able to um, uh, see the benefits of this uh, insurance project and insurance payout uh, because uh, it triggered a response um, by Hurricane Delta on October 7th, um, 2020. And it offered a payout of 40% or $850,000 and this money um, was sent to what we call Reef Brigade. So they are a group of volunteers um, from, from various sectors, um, you know, people who really depend on, on coastal economy, um, who volunteer to you know, um, go out with some training, um, go out for two months um, to help stabilize 2,152 coral colonies, and they collected th over 13,000 broken corals as well. And um, the restoration efforts they do take time. Um, it, it will take about two years to restore these reefs um, to be ready to help people along the coast be resilient and, and be protected if another storm um, comes, comes across their way. So super innovative and we're planning to um, scale this model in, in different parts of the world as well. So one of the first um, insurance for nature uh, models out there. And I can't seem to move on to my next screen here. Just one moment. Oh, there it is. So I wanted to um, end with a couple of uh, takeaways. Um, one is that nature-based solutions are increasingly becoming recognized as an effective multi-benefit mechanism to help vulnerable people become more resilient to climate change. Um, I would say nature-based solutions is really, you know, slowly gaining traction. Um, it's not quite up there uh, in terms of um, the most popular adaptation solution, but it is very much uh, gaining in popularity. And one of the reasons is because um, compared to built infrastructure, for instance, if you have um, seawalls um, that, that protect people along the shoreline, 
seawalls cost a lot more than protecting nature-based solutions, protecting reefs and mangroves. Um, and seawalls don't necessarily provide um, these livelihood and food security benefits as you would find um, when you protect coral reefs and mangroves, for instance. So they're slowly becoming more and more um, uh, sort of a, a more, more popular adaptation uh, option, I would say. I would also say that connecting science, planning, and communities through partnerships is an extremely effective way to build knowledge and capacity to use ecosystems to reduce impacts of climate hazards. So there, so no one group or one person can, can help restore and protect um, these nature-based solutions. It really takes an army of people. It really takes scientists offering um, knowledge uh, about climate risks, for instance, offering knowledge about how best to restore um, reefs and mangroves. It takes a lot of people in, in planning, um, not only, of course, uh, communities are, are the most important stakeholders because they are the stewards of, of protecting mangroves and reefs in most cases, but it involves um, government agencies. It involves disaster risk reduction planners, adaptation planners, um, you know, all sorts of stakeholders to come together to develop a partnership, which can be challenging, um, but it's also extremely effective. And, and, and I think that is the way to go is through such partnerships. And let me leave you with my last thought here, um, which is about how media can improve coverage. I think it, media can help improve coverage by telling more human stories um, and, and telling more positive stories. So not necessarily waiting for a disaster to happen and then tell a story uh, about how it's affected people, but to share you know, all the positive stories out there in terms of how people are already protecting nature or using nature-based solutions and protecting reefs and mangroves even before a storm comes because it is a way for them to prepare and to become resilient um, before the next climate disaster happens. So I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moshmi. Thank you. That's a wonderful summary of the possibilities for nature-based solutions. And I think probably we just scratched the surface there. So uh, for all you participants, uh, please, if you have questions for Moshmi, please put them in the Q&A feature. And we're going to get to them uh, after our other panelists. For now, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Tai from the World Resources Institute to uh, share some case studies about coastal resilience that many of you journalists out there might find instructive. Stephanie? Thank you, James. So good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I see people joining from Kenya, India, and Bangladesh. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to present to all of you. Uh, briefly, I work at the World Resources Institute, which is an um, international organization uh, dedicated to research and just having a positive impact around sustainable development, especially on global issues at the nexus of like, human society, the, the economy and the environment. And yeah, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and start. So accelerating climate adaptation action to protect people and secure economies and coastal areas across the world is essential. As James mentioned today, I'll be sharing stories from three different parts of the world of on the ground progress when it comes to protecting these coastal regions and how this progress came about. Uh, but first I'd like to just reemphasize what my co-panelist has already said that climate impacts are definitely on the rise. This is undeniable by now and coastal communities are particularly vulnerable to these impacts. This is because nearly 2.4 billion, billion people, or about 40% of the world's population, live within 100 kilometers of a coastline. And by the year 2030, this number is expected to go up to 6 billion people who will be living within 200 kilometers of a coastline. In addition, the world and coast especially are becoming more and more urban. So people are moving more and more towards cities. And a lot of these cities are actually near the, or in these coastal areas. So this means that more people and more segments of the economy will be exposed to these coastal climate threats. And this means that 
adapting to climate change is a must, not just for, for governments, but the private sector and other aspects of society as well. Uh, climate change threats in coastal areas range from like short-term threats like hurricanes, extreme rainfall, extreme flooding, to more like slow onset events that can be uh, less visible. These include things like sea level rise and increasing salt intrusion, which has a like a very negative effect on freshwater supplies for people who live in coasts and also people who engage in, in agriculture. This has like a very negative effect on, on those systems. And as both James and, and Moshimi have said, these impacts will continue to rise in the intensity and frequency that they occur. And so they'll continue to be a, a big topic that the media has to cover. And low income countries are hit the hardest when it comes to this, to these uh, threats. And they oft often don't have the time to recover or to rebuild before the next threat is already upon them. For example, the, the Philippines is hit on average by 20 typhoons every year. So it's every year. And of those 25 are very, very devastating. So, so it's just a, a huge, huge problem. And because climate impact will affect every element and every aspect of, of human society, this means that it also needs to be kind of integrated or considered at all levels of government and across sectors. So this is why integrating adaptation or mainstreaming adaptation, as we like to say, kind of in the climate adaptation space is, is a must. And even though challenges like political instability and the problem of coordinating across different jurisdictions and also the kind of this um, always present problem of insufficient funding are big challenges. There are countries, there are many countries that are taking steps to actually implement adaptation measures on the ground. So I would like to share examples from three locations that are doing this. And they are Bangladesh, Cartagena in Colombia, and the Philippines. So these are three locations that are featured in a WRI working paper that was published in 2020, co-authored by Jakob Waslander, my co-panelist, Dr. Moshumi Chaudhuri, and myself. And we really hope that these, these stories from these three locations could help inspire more action and just show the world that even when there are obstacles, you can still move the needle from having just a policy or a strategy to having action on the ground. So in our research, we came across these six factors that really help to uh, create the right conditions for success. They are policies, sustained leadership, smart partnerships, the right information and tools, having a whole of government approach, which means all sectors of government are involved and financing. And I will now go over each one briefly with an example or two from the case studies. So for the first one, for the power of policies, I would like to share how Malabon City in the Philippines really wanted to protect its population from reoccurring flooding from rains, rivers, and high tides. And city officials knew that the national uh, government was shifting policies so that instead of responding to disasters, the government could more proactively help manage and prevent them. So city officials uh, knew this, they took advantage of this to, uh, to organize and get together with community leaders and became, become engaged in this topic and to request support from the national government using this new strategy as a basis. So this is one example of how that one particular policy really enabled the city to take action. Uh, with regard to sustained leadership, 
in Bangladesh, politicians and government officials have really demonstrated consistent leadership on adaptation for many, many years now. And this includes members of, of parliament from different political parties working together and at very high levels of government agreeing that addressing climate change is a priority and keeping it as a priority for, for the government. So as you can see from this graphic, there has been a dramatic positive impact in Bangladesh with regard to number of just lives saved when it comes to uh, these devastating cyclones. Uh, the next factor is smart partnerships. In Cartagena, in Colombia, uh, businesses join civil society groups to really uh, make adaptation um, an item for the for political agenda. They knew that climate change, even if it wasn't at that time a city priority, it was a phenomenon that was going to affect just every aspect of, of the economy and therefore uh, people's livelihoods and way of life. So they created this, this alliance to really uh, make it a, an issue for the city and then work with city officials to create a, a city plan to yeah, to uh, bring about kind of a more sustainable vision for the city. Uh, this one I'll just spend a, a short few seconds on. It's important to make information easy to understand and accessible for people who need it. In Malabon City, for example, officials have printed flood risk maps on tarpaulins in very public places so that people can see and, and really know how at risk they're they are, their house, their, uh, their offices. A uh, whole of government approaches is, is very important as I mentioned earlier, because uh, adapting to climate change is not, respons not the responsibility of just one ministry or, or one office, but it's actually a joint responsibility across um, ministry departments. And yeah, it's the responsibility from the national to the state, to the regional to the city level because it is something that is going to impact everyone. And uh, last but not least, making financing available is critical to really, yeah, to really making anything happen on the ground. In Bangladesh, uh, two trust, two funds have been established to dedicate um, money and resources for climate change uh, protection. In the Philippines, something similar, but more at the, the local level. And the government has also dedicated 5% of their revenue to uh, disaster risk reduction. And Cartagena has also secured external and private funding from these businesses that I mentioned before. A few key messages that I would like to just end with are that uh, climate threats to coastal areas will continue to take center stage and will become even more prevalent in the years to come. That closing the gap between policies and plans and action on the ground is possible. There are positive stories out there as I just shared. And it's important to, yeah, to share these lessons with other countries, with other parts of the world. And this is where the media can really play a key role. And as, as Moshimi also mentioned that there, there is here a great opportunity for the media to uh, not just cover disasters and tragedies, but also uh, solutions, lessons, positive stories, and even stories of averted disasters. So these are also things that I, I think readers would be really interested in learning more about. If you would like to read more about these case studies, I invite you to check out our working paper and I'll post the link in the chat. Thank you, Stephanie. That was wonderful. Uh, some wonderful examples of case studies. Journalists always love case studies. They're great to report on. So uh, I'm sure there are others out there. And we, if, you know, we, for those of you in the audience, you should be looking for your own examples in your home countries. But uh, you know, um, I, I see we have several questions now in the Q and A feature. Thank you for those. Keep them coming. 
Uh, we're going to get to them in a moment. For now, uh, thanks again, Stephanie. I'm going to turn it over to Joydeep Gupta for the uh, journalist perspective. Joydeep is a veteran journalist who uh, is the director of the Third Pole website uh, based in, in, he's based in New Delhi, and but he covers all of South Asia and has really led many of uh, EJN's resilience reporting initiatives in the region. Joydeep. Hi, thanks, James. Hi, everybody. I really enjoyed listening and watching the previous speakers. It taught me a lot. And I do hope it has been useful to this audience in which I can recognize a lot of my colleagues. And I'm very gl glad to see them because I had an inkling that the two experts speaking before me, Moshumi and Stephanie, would provide the information, the understanding, the perspective that we need. And then I could have a sort of a conversation with everybody in the room, and we could all have a conversation more specifically on story ideas, on coastal resilience. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And I will try to keep this as short as I can so that we have maximum time for a discussion. So let me, let me start by talking about my experiences while working on the Bay of Bengal project, a four-year project that ended on the 31st of December, 2021, which, and which looked at various media-related aspects of climate change impacts and resilience in the communities. So the first thing that we looked at was where, where do the communities in Bangladesh, along the Eastern coast of India, where do they get their information from? On climate change, on slow impacts, slow onset impacts like sea level rise, like salinity, and on disasters like cyclones, other, other storms, floods, where do the where do where are the communities getting their information from? And we found that the information ecosystem is fairly well developed when it comes to disasters, when it comes to the quick impacts of climate change. As we saw in the graph earlier, the number of human deaths in Bangladesh has on, through cyclones has come down dramatically. It's the same dramatic decrease all along the east coast of India. And this is be partly because our weather uh, forecasts have become so, so much better, and partly because that those better forecasts, which can track cyclones now three, four days in advance, are now actually being disseminated to the communities very, very effectively. And so there are some things we are doing right as journalists. There are some things we're not doing so well on. There are a few of us who are doing well, but many of us are not. And that is looking at, the uh, when it comes to disasters, looking at losses apart from human deaths. So here's a story idea for all of you. When a storm, whether it's a cyclone, as it's called a cyclone here, or a typhoon in the Philippines, or a hurricane in the Caribbean, is the same thing. When that storm hits, you know that now we have met officers who can predict that storm so people can be evacuated to safer zones, and the human deaths have gone down. Have the economic losses gone down? Have the, has the, have the livestock deaths gone down? People have space to move. Where will they move their livestock? Do we have shelters for livestock? Bangladesh has started building shelters for livestock in the cyclone shelters. 
India still hasn't. I don't know whether, how many other countries have started building storm shelters for livestock. And even in Bangladesh, the storm shelters, the cyclone shelters for livestock are inadequate. They're not big enough for the livestock in the village. And you see, you will see reports before every storm that the authorities are coming, are repeatedly telling communities to move and people are not wanting to move. They're not mad, you know. They're, why don't they want to move? They don't want to move because they don't want to leave their livestock behind. They <coughs> are both an economic asset and they have very strong cultural, so social links with the livestock at home. I think these are stories that we could look at. One story idea here. Another story idea that comes from slow onset uh, impacts. Now we know scientists have told us repeatedly that especially in tropical waters and subtropical waters, due to climate change, fish stocks have moved away from coastal zones. So fish when fish stocks have moved away from coastal zones, that affects the livelihood of fishers. They have to go further out. It means more money, more time to catch the same fish or even the uh, same amount of fish or even less fish. Are there any resilience methods? Is somebody trying anything? You know that some in some many places people are trying fish farming. Are they good adaptation or are they maladaptation? I think this is a story worth pursuing. Same definitely goes with shrimp farming and crab farming on the coasts. I know people know about this, so I'm not going to go into details of shrimp and crab farming on the coast. I'm going to go into what a very underreported aspect of climate impacts that we found during this four-year project with the Earth Journalism Network. And in, I'm quite proud to say that we fostered a large number of stories on this underreported aspect. And that is what happens when people are forced to drink increasingly saline water. What happens is men, women, children, everybody starts getting higher blood pressure. And this is absolutely critical for women, especially pregnant women, because it leads to the risk of preeclampsia. And this is a very, very major impact that anybody who has worked as a journalist, as a researcher in the coastal areas of the, anywhere in the tropics, anywhere in the world now knows about if he or she is asking the right questions. I know, I can see colleagues in this virtual room who have done excellent reports on impacts on health, especially women's health, of being forced to drink increasingly saline water. Now, I am asking all of you to take the next step. Are, what are the resilience measures? We all realize, I think, that all of, all of us can't have, can't afford to have RO water, reverse osmosis water. But we are finding, especially along the Bangladesh coast, we are finding big RO plants have become the only source of potable water in large parts of the Bangladesh coast, especially the areas near the Sundarbans. So given that, is that the way to build resilience? Is there another way to build resilience? Should we see if communities if we all know that communities in coastal areas 
collect as much rainwater as they can and use it for as long as they can is a way to build resilience in those communities to improve that storage capacity. How do we sort this out? A lot of this also has to do with plane communications. We found firsthand that when people realized the impact, they knew that they, they were suffering from high blood pressure. Women knew that they were suffering from serious problems when they were pregnant. And apart from high blood pressure, prolonged exposure to increasingly brackish water, increasingly saline water, also leads to a whole host of skin ailments. We have known that. And it's increasing. We have known that. When some stories as part of the project, of the Bay of Bengal project, pointed this out when this was published, and it was actually read. And after that, we went to a fisher's village. And the women almost mobbed that reporter and said, thank you very much. Do you know what we have done as a result of what we read? And he asked what? They said, we have drastically reduced the amount of salt we use in cooking. Because the water is salty anyway. It's a, it's, when you think about it, it's a plain common sense way of building resilience. And as journalists, I think we can play very important roles here, communicating these simple methods of resilience. I hope I've been able to give you at least some story ideas with which we can start a discussion. And I think I should stop here so that we can all start talking to each other. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joydeep, for especially for highlighting those health impacts of, of climate change along the coast. I think I agree, this is a very underreported topic and uh, you know a rich area for journalists to explore. Um, I, I would add that uh, the, the Bay of Bengal project that you led uh, also produced a kind of mini report on, I think about 15 innovative and community-led solutions, like just like the one you just mentioned about uh, women using less salt in their cooking to compensate for the increased salt in the water. Uh, so the, there are lots of clever things going on and journalists can do a really important service by uh, highlighting those. Now we're going to turn it over to your questions. Thank you very much to everyone who asked questions. Uh, a couple of uh, brief ones to begin with. First of all, we'd ask our panelists, there's been a request for your resources, uh, links to your resources. So when you're not talking, if you have a chance, maybe just uh, post uh, some links to any resources you might want to share in the chat. Uh, a very quick question here, I thought it was interesting. The, is there a difference between resilience and adaptation? I think the, uh, the commentator mentioned that they're used interchangeably. I think I also use them pretty much interchangeably. Do you guys agree they are pretty much the same or is there, do you distinguish between the two terms? I can, I can go first. So I don't use them interchangeably, but they are, they do have some important similarities, but also differences. So adaptation is more of a, it's the process by which human systems or the environment or a system is adjusting to uh, different effects of climate change. And resilience is more of a, a trait or, a, or an ability that something or someone has to cope with, with a, a disturbance, with a hazard, or with a, the new trend. And it's generally seen as something that's kind of a, like a negative uh, hazard or a threat, so it's ability to kind of bounce back from this, what is seemingly kind of a, a negative thing happening to the, the system. So that's, uh, that's at least how I would explain them. I don't know if, if Moshimi would like to kind of compliment anything that I said. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that stuff. Um, what I would add is that for me, adaptation is a process. 
So there are many steps that you have to go through to adapt to climate change um, before you become resilient. So for me, resilient is like the ultimate goal is, you know, through the process of adaptation, you become resilient so that you can, as Stephanie was saying, bounce back better. So, and so the next time you are hit with a cyclone, you have the resources, the skills, the knowledge, the, the connections to help you rebuild your life much faster and in a much more um, less painful way, I would say. Um, so that's that's how I would add to it. Great, thank you. If I, can I just say that another way I look at it, James, is if you have good adaptation, that builds resilience. So you are, if you have the good adaptation program, uh, so, uh, that will build. Uh, let's take a simple example. If you have a house on the coast that gets pulled down, uh, blown away every time there's a big storm, so then you build a stronger house, a brick and mortar house instead of a hut. So you are building your own resilience by adapting. That's a very, that's a fairly expensive way of doing it, and not everybody can afford to do that. But that kind of adaptation does build resilience. And if I can add just one last thing is, I know we've been talking about kind of adapting to climate change more in, um, I guess, a manner of like negative climate change impacts, but there are places that will actually have positive impacts from climate change. So weather might become more favorable for agriculture, for example. So in that sense, adaptation is adjusting to the effects of climate change, which can be negative or positive for a community. It all depends on context because climate impacts are just so context specific that you really need to understand the situation from a local level. Great, thank you all for the uh, explanation. That's very helpful. First, the uh, next question is for Moshmi. Um, uh, the question is what you presented some great nature-based solutions, but what can people in larger cities like Mumbai where they might not have, you know, basically access to nature-based solutions. What, what should they be doing perhaps to, to adapt? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think first it's important to investigate whether there are nature-based solutions. They may not be immediately right in front of the city, um, you know, when you're looking at the city from the coast, um, but they may be around the periphery, which can also help reduce impact. So um, first thing I would add to that is that, you know, beyond the reefs and mangroves um, that I've mentioned, um, there could be other uh, ecosystems that could be helpful. So for instance, you could have seagrass, you could have marshlands and swamps, you could have dunes, shelter belts. Um, these, are these are other ecosystems that could protect the shoreline. Um, you know, and I would also like to say that, you know, Many times nature-based solutions are complemented by built infrastructure. So I have seen cases where, you know, you do have um, mangroves that are sort of fortified or complemented with seawalls. Um, in most urban cases, you do see more built infrastructure um, because there is very little natural uh, resources left along the coast. Um, so built in infrastructure is, is one way to go for sure, but you can complement it with these other ecosystems that may not be directly in front of a city, but in the periphery that can also help um, provide that protection. Um, so it's, it's a combination of things and it's a matter of also exploring um, what are the various natural resources that, that could also help around the city. Thank you, Moshmi. Yeah, and I probably add there are certainly different ways if you're even if you are doing built infrastructure or hard infrastructure there are different ways to do it some of them are more community friendly than others I know where I live in the Bay Area you know the cities are grappling with how best to kind of raise their coastal de defenses uh, in a way that will they can they can be used for community based activities as well like parks and things, not just big brick wall, big, big cement walls. Um, a couple of other questions and anyone is welcome to chime in. Um, how, 
what is the best way to regenerate mangroves? Does that have to be done through the use of plant nurseries and replanting or are there other ways to do it? Um, and how can other countries implement insurance uh, schemes like the, the one you mentioned, Moshmi? Sure, I, I can start. I mean, uh, I'm not an ecologist, so I don't have the details in terms of how to plant mangroves. Um, but, but yes, it, it is oftentimes they are grown, seedlings or, or saplings are grown in a nursery and then planted. Um, and then there are um, restoration techniques um, that, that you could also look into. Um, I would suggest that you um, contact um, perhaps your local university or um, a, a local environmental organization that may have the details in terms of, you know, how do you actually, uh, you know, plant the mangroves. Um, so that I think that would be, um, so, so that kind of goes along with what I was saying that, you know, you need to involve um, multiple actors uh, to, to really get the benefits of these nature-based solutions. And in this case, it would be, um, you know, plant ecologists who would have the answer to that question. Um, in terms of, um, how to scale the, the insurance product, um, it, it is complicated. Um, it is unusual, um, although it is changing a little bit to, for, for instance, for an insurance company to be interested um, in protecting nature. Uh, first of all. So I think one would have to first, you know, find those allies in the insurance world who are supportive of, of um, these kinds of, you know, sustainable development or environmental uh, aspects. Um, and then really work with them to help understand or help them understand um, what is the value of nature-based solutions and how a product um, can be created. Oftentimes, um, it's very difficult for, for communities to purchase these insurance on their own because premiums are expensive. Um, so oftentimes you can, you can get, for instance, hotels that obviously have a lot of money um, along the coast to, to purchase the insurance so that it protects the coast and communities along the coast also benefit. It's not just the hotel benefiting, for instance. Um, so you have to really build those uh, partnerships, which is, you know, one of the critical elements that Stephanie was mentioning in, in her presentation is, you know, the coordination across sectors, across different types of partnerships are absolutely key. And um, I would say uh, also like a knowledge broker. So for instance, the Nature Conservancy where I work um, was the knowledge broker between the insurance company and hotels along the coast. Um, to bring the bring the insurance company together with government partners to help design um, the the insurance product and test it out. I mean, this was this was a pilot, and it showed that it worked. Um, with, you know, when the hurricane came in um, in 2020, and so we're hoping to scale that kind of partnership model and develop a premium or sorry, a product and a premium that's affordable for communities um, depending on the context. Um, and so we're hoping to scale this in um, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Thank you, Moshmi. Uh, we have a question uh, about how, how can marine protected areas potentially help build coastal resilience, I guess in particular for fisheries, but perhaps for in other ways too. Would anyone like to address this question? I can take a stab. Um, so marine protected areas usually already have coral reefs, already have mangroves. Um, I think what's, what's one benefit of marine protected areas is that you already have governance systems in place that protect these natural ecosystems. Um, and, and um, you know, there is a sort of, um, policing is the wrong word, but, you know, monitoring, that's what I was looking for, monitoring that, uh, monitoring of these ecosystems to make sure that they are being well managed, that they are, you know, um, on par or up to par to protect people along the coast and provide those livelihood and, and secure and food security benefits. So uh, marine protected areas, you know, already has that protection um, concept in mind. And I, and I think that's a really, also a really great way um, to, to protect and use nature-based solutions through that governance system. Yes, thank you, Moshmi. And I would add, as Jodeep mentioned, 
one of the challenges of climate change is you have changes in fish stocks and, and fish migration patterns, and that can affect livelihoods. But marine protected areas have been shown to help restore fish stocks and, and replenish, not just in the protected areas themselves, but also replenish fisheries uh, along adjacent coastlines. So uh, in terms of livelihoods, I think uh, marine protected areas can help really build resilience for uh, um, um, in fishing communities. Uh, we have a question for Stephanie. Um, how did uh, your team identify Malabon as a good place to, to carry out this case study? Mm -hmm. So for the paper, we actually did a very extensive review of, of documents, including national adaptation plans, nationally determined contribution documents, and, and other resources to identify the, the three countries that we, we did for this paper on coastal resilience. And within the Philippines, it was Malibuan City that had enough documented materials and evidence for us to actually, you know, be able to analyze it, the information and, and come across the, the lessons learned and the, how the common factors. And especially there were very specific like local, uh, like local plans, like the land use plan and, and other plans that we could refer to. And I also saw that if I made the, the same person ask the question about how can local governments ensure that there's like sustained like leadership or, or attention on adaptation, even when there are many changes in kind of the political leaders. So uh, we found that this was a case in, in Cartagena in Colombia that the city went through uh, at least half a dozen mayors in a very short span of time. And it was just very disruptive politically for the political priorities in the, the city, but thanks to this alliance of business sector with private associations, private citizens, and, and other local leaders, and th this coalition really helped to kind of maintain momentum on adaptation. And as, as I said, they were able to work with the local officials, even if they were changing very constantly, they were able to work with local officials to draft the city strategy uh, plan for, for C. And so this was a way that, that this city in particular was able to kind of keep the momentum going on adaptation despite many changes in, in the local leadership. So that is, that is one way, again, emphasizing the really critical role of, of partnerships and having the right players there at the table. Thank you, Stephanie. We are coming towards the end of our webinar. So Really appreciate all these questions and answers. I'm gonna, I'm gonna in a moment. I'll uh, I'll give the speakers each a chance for just one uh, one minute final reflection uh, on the topic. A uh, reminder to everyone that this is just the first in a series of webinars. We're going to be diving deeper into uh, topics, not just sea level rise and storms, but also topics like food security and migration and livelihoods and health and other, other topics all related to coastal resilience. Um, so please stay tuned for more webinars. And uh, as you can see in the chat, there are opportunities now for journalists to apply for funds to do stories. So get those story ideas in. Um, we have a week left to apply. Uh, we do have one final question I wanted to ask before I turn it over to the panelists for the final reflections. It's a tough one. I don't know if we can really address it properly, but let's give it a shot. Is well, We have a question, uh, I believe from Madagascar. Uh, for communities who have tried every kind of nature-based solution, but nothing works, uh, do you have any recommendations for them? Is there anything you can say? I mean, I, 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 I think, you know, it really fundamentally boils down to governance. Um, you know, who, who is in charge of making the rules in terms of protecting a natural ecosystem? Um, you know, how can we best monitor these ecosystems? Who can benefit? I, I think it, it boils down to those questions. And 
if you, you know, if, if you do have the right combination of people, um, I, I think nature-based solutions or, or natural ecosystems could be protected. Um, and again, uh, you know, even though we're promoting nature-based solutions, it doesn't mean that um, built infrastructure won't help as well. So a again, a combination of um, built infrastructure and improving governance over ecosystems, uh, I, I think would be the way to go. Great, thank you, Mishmi. And I, I apologize, that question was from Fiji, not from Madagascar. Um, and I, I, I see we have a uh, attendee from Kerala who is talking about how the state government is trying different strategies as opposed to building seawalls or, or, or rocky infrastructure. They're trying something called geotubes. So, uh, you know, there are new ideas being tried out there. there um, I think the general consensus is we should try nature-based solutions first. There are, are there also other ways to do more innovative uh, kind of hard infrastructure as well. But let me um, thank our panelists again for your, your, your participation today. And I'm gonna ask each of you just to, for your final reflections, perhaps just one minute. Moshmi, maybe we'll, you can kick us off with that. Sure, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I really enjoyed the questions and the presentations. I would just say, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, what Stephanie presented, you know, the, the five um, key ingredients, you know, the political will, mainstreaming, um, nature-based solutions, coordination, funding, and information and tools. I think what I would add to that is, is again, looking at governance structures and, and, and understanding local level governance that could help protect and help us benefit from nature-based solutions. Um, and, and I really enjoyed what Joydeep also mentioned. I, I think what, what Joydeep is was I think one of the things he was getting at is you know what are the different multiple uh, resi resilience measures ways to ways to build resilience I mean there and that's an excellent point there could be so many I mean nature based solutions is one among many um, and and you know especially in in coastal areas like um, the areas that the Joydeep was referring to um, you know just to plug one last nature based solution component I mean. Protecting mangroves is really, really critical there because they help reduce um, soil erosion. And when you reduce soil erosion, you also reduce sea level rise that leads to salinity. So um, again, multiple benefits of nature-based solutions, but it's not the only solution. Thanks. Thank you, Moshmi. Stephanie? Thanks, James. Well, first, thank you to all the journalists and all the, the people who have joined today for, for this hour of your time. And I was just reflecting a bit on how like the, the researchers, the, the scientists, all of us working on climate change and climate adaptation in particular, we're very, very passionate about this issue and trying to like protect people and ecosystems and the economy. But we don't always have the best way of communicating with our audience or with the general public. So this is where we, we really need the help of, of journalism and, and the media and the press to kind of help us translate what we sometimes use more technical terms and technical concepts. Like we really need your help translating and communicating these issues to reach more people and to educate people, to inspire other people to, to really take action and to, to help us just have a more positive impact on the world. So that would be my final reflection. Thank you, Stephanie. And Chaudeep, we're gonna give you the final word. Thanks. Uh, I'm in, in fact going to start by requesting my two co-panelists to please share their PPTs with everybody uh, because I know that everybody's going to get their recording but it always helps journalists if they can also see this, see the numbers in front of them when they're doing the story. So that would be very helpful if we agree. The other thing is to, again, to all my colleagues in this virtual room, look, uh, the majority of people in this world want to live along the coasts because it's got so many advantages and the majority and a very, very large percentage of people in this world actually live along the coasts. And now, by now, all governments, local, national, are aware of the risks being faced along the coasts. And by and large, 
the governments are responding by building more sea walls by by and large so i think it's very important that we question this thank you Thank you, Jody. Yes, I think that could be the topic for another webinar, the difference between hard and soft infrastructure. So just a reminder before we close that um, we will be posting a recording of this on the Earth Journalism Network website. We'll be in touch with a survey to ask the attendees for what they thought about this webinar and how we can do things even better in the future. And we, uh, we will do our best to get you resources and other things that were mentioned in this webinar. So thank you once again to all our panelists and to all of you in the audience for joining this discussion. We, uh, we hope you found it helpful and stay tuned for many more webinars on the topic of coastal resilience. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.